Hello, everyone. My name is Linda Groseth, Program Director for Vision Loss Alliance, and also with us this evening, Elsa Zavoda, Vice President of Programs. Good evening. For those of you who don't know us, we are the voices you hear welcoming everyone into the VLA Zoom room. Thank you for joining us this evening. And just a reminder, this program will be recorded. We ask that you please yes. mute yourself. I will give you a, about 20 seconds of quiet and we will begin. This evening programs is sponsored by Vision Loss Alliance of New Jersey. In addition to evening program opportunities, VLA offers an array of in-person programs and weekly virtual programs. If you're interested in learning more about our organization and programs, please contact me, Linda Grosseff, at 973-6270. Zero, five, five, prompt number four. Tonight, we are welcome back. Doug Gilbert, Certified Orientation and Mobility Specialist, who will be presenting on the weather, an ever-present factor that influences the travel environment. How does the weather impact the assorted factors on the blind and low vision traveler? We will cover issues such as reduced sensory perception, clothing choices, impact on a white cane or a guide dog, comfort and the impact of the senses and judgment, and travel places. Before we begin, I'd like to share about our guest. Doug's vision loss was detected when he was an infant and later at the age of four years old, he was diagnosed with dyslexia. Doug is a graduate of Rutgers University with a degree in the School of Management and Labor Relations. He has been an advocate for the Client Assist Program, a job developer coordinator for the Adjustment to Vision Loss Program, and a travel instructor for NJ at Rutgers, where he taught students with disabilities how to use public transportation. Doug is a recent graduate from Salis University and has a master's degree in orientation and mobility. We ask that you allow our guests time to present. When it's time for questions, Doug will cue you. When you ask your question, please raise your hand. Let's review our Zoom protocol for tonight. For those of you who have dialed in, the raise your hand feature is star nine. Star six will mute and unmute you, giving you the opportunity to ask your question. If you are on a computer, Alt-Y, raise your hand. Alt-A is the mute and unmute command. Using the Zoom app on the iPad, move to the top right, select the more option and flick down to the raise hand. On the iPhone, this feature is located at the bottom of the screen on the right. And at this time, I would like to welcome Doug Gilbert. Doug, take it away. Good evening, everyone. How's everyone doing? Good? Everybody's good. Nobody, but yeah. good. All right. So we happen to live on a we have to we happen to live on a rock that's about eight thousand miles wide. It's about ninety-five million miles away from a star. So we have energy. We have an atmosphere. We have water. You put all that together, and what do you get? You get weather. That's right. You can't get away from it. Um, I suppose you could, but you'd have to dig real, real deep. All right. And so, so let's let's talk about. I'd like to talk about you know how the weather is can pretty much play Mary Hob with all of your senses. All right. So um, let's talk about the kinds of weather that we could encounter here in the Garden State. Right now, it's raining here in central New Jersey. And so um, what, is, what is it from the membership? Uh, what, do you think, what do you think rain could do to the low vision or the no vision traveler when you're outside? 
If you want to ask or, or make a comment, you can unmute yourself, please. Don't be shy. So rain is one of these ever present kinds of weather that can pretty much encompass uh, all the factors that can actually do, uh, that could actually impact the perceptions of, of, the, uh, of, a, of a cane traveler or a guide dog traveler. Um, the first I could think of is sound, all right? The, the presence, there's, there's actually extra stuff in the air, okay? It's not just oxygen and nitrogen and a little bit of water vapor. The amount of water is actually saturating the atmosphere. And believe it or not, it actually has an impact on sound. Uh, snow does too, it can actually absorb sound. It can actually, uh, the, a great, better example would be like if you've ever been um, in the snow, there's like already a couple of inches on the ground. To me, the world sounds different than when it's not snowing or when there's not snow on the ground. I'm talking about the, uh, I think the word, there's a, Snow makes a sound when it when it hits something. It's sort of a, it could be a hard. It's sort of a like a like a tinkle. Like if like if a kid like when a child is playing with a bucket at the beach, you know the the sound of sand being poured from the shovel onto the ground. It it's actually there. Um, net result is this can diminish your ability to perceive sounds or even distinguish them from the environment. It kind of makes things a little mushy. Um, one of the analogies I use, it's kind of like, uh, like you're listening to a radio in your bed and then you pull the covers up over your head. That radio is gonna sound somewhat different. All right, um, anyone else? What else could rain do to the cane traveler or the dog traveler, anyone? Well, it also slides into your choice of clothing when it comes to weather, all right? Um, I'm maybe I'm jumping around a little bit, but comfort is a huge uh, parameter when it comes to, to traveling, even for typical people. Um, I can't tell you that uh, one of the most important aspects of dinner growing up is that number one the six o'clock news was always on and number two you had better be quiet during the weather report which used to be at the end of the news because well that's pretty much what dictated what we're going to wear the next day um, and that is totally in, important to the cane traveler and the dog traveler because unlike typical travelers we are outside more often than others we just are. We have no choice but to walk greater distances than typical people. So with that in mind, comfort is king. If you are uncomfortable, you don't make good decisions, right? When you were a kid, still in school, how many of us wanted to take an exam when we had the flu? Right? Right? And how many of us could actually get that exam postponed if we got a doctor's note saying, I had the flu on this date. I'd like to reschedule my exam. It's a real thing. So aside from the horrors of the flu or COVID or whatever, just the idea of being overly cold, overly hot, wet and damp, which leads to cold, um, or, uh, you, know, um, you know, these things, they, they, they change our comfort level. We, we are no longer just concerned about, one second, achoo, excuse God, me. God bless you. Uh, thank you. Yeah, it, it's allergy season for me. So, uh, so like, like I said, indicated, comfort can seriously impact your decision-making ability. Um, you know, because you're, you're, you're not just thinking about where you're going and how you're going to get there. You're also thinking, oh, when will this end? How can I get out of this? And that's true for all kinds of weather. But 
if we could mitigate these circumstances, um, you know, wearing a jacket when it's cold, something water repellent when we're going to be experiencing precipitation, um, wearing different layers of clothing. Uh, I learned that the hard way uh, visiting my sister in Colorado. Um, if you have different layers of clothing uh, and a bag to put them in, <laughs> uh, you have the ability to, to regulate your, your comfort level um, at a much more significant level. Um, any thoughts, questions, or concerns at this juncture? Does anyone have any questions or comments? Any questions? Andrew. I really think that with rain, especially with the noise, uh, rain especially, I think, can create you know, a lot of noise, especially with traffic. I almost think in some ways it can kind of amplify traffic in some areas, kind of depending on where you are, how hard the rain is. You're, rain you're can certainly be interesting that way. <laughs> Right, the, the pitter-patter of raindrops, you know, um, it, it's quite significant. Um, of course, when you're harder surfaces, it gets even louder. So yes, you'll hear it on grass and dirt, but on concrete, on a car roof, um, on a tin roof, yes. Uh, so, and, so, you know, and, and of course, uh, you're right that the traffic noise is amplified in that the, the tread of the tire, okay, there's a, um, there's a sort of a like a whir sound as a, if if you could if you could listen to like a like a Prius when it passes by if you could filter out yourself the um, the 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 hum of the battery your the tires of the car make about a third of the noise that a car is going to make while it's traveling all right and that increase I don't know how much it increases when there's water on the ground but that splash of the tire tread, basically moving the water away from the tire pavement boundary. Yes, that, that creates a noise in and of itself. And of course, if there's puddles, it's even louder as, as the tire and, and the car plow through um, that. So, so yes, it can radically increase the overall amount of background noise. Um, so that can definitely muffle your traffic sounds. It, it could deceive you as to how many cars are coming, how far away they are. Um, it can, and, and uh, other aspects of the sound of the rain can also mask other crucial, cr cr bleh, crucial <laughs> clues when it, when it comes to, you know, interpreting the environment. Um, anyway, if I, unless anyone else has something else to add about rain, I'm going to move on. Any All other right. rain people? Any more rain people? All right, let's talk about snow. All right. You think it's over, don't you? Because it's April and Easter's right around the corner. Uh-uh. No. Mother Nature is a sarcastic so-and-so. Okay, and she can, and she still has the potential, ladies and gentlemen, to drop a good foot of snow on us. All right, it's happened before. I've seen it. I've been caught in it. It's not pleasant. So, with that in mind, what are the differences that snow can bring to the travel environment that rain might not, or that it could that could just pile on top of the rain? It's colder. Yeah, colder. Mm -hmm. The misery factor can be significantly increased. All right, especially with wind chill. Um, I can't remember exactly what the formula was, but wind chill is is uh, is basically it's the temperature, and it's and there's a um, uh, I can't think of a better word. I'm going to call them aggravating circumstances of humidity and wind. Uh, basically, the wind and the humidity they, they kind of combine to make evaporation much faster. And I don't know if anyone had, um, you know, a uh, um, chemistry class in 11th grade, but the act of evaporation, um, basically the, the water or the, the fluid that's on your skin or on your coat, the act of that basically becoming, going from a liquid to a vapor 
it actually takes energy away from your skin. It is actually taking heat because that, that water wants to achieve equilibrium. So if that water is on your skin, that water is going to suck the heat out of your skin into itself to try and achieve equilibrium. And that's why evaporation causes cooling. And then you aggravate that with wind and it's even worse. And even worse than that, it's not just the sensation of being colder, you will be colder, okay? Um, hypothermia is a very real thing. If we do not have the right clothing, um, or if the temperature is in fact too cold and we get too cold or and are too wet, um, we can die. Uh, this is a uh, very, uh, yeah, go on. Oh, was that just an app? No, this is Wendy Davis. Hi, Wendy. I'm new to the group. Hi there, Linda. Thank you so much for welcoming me. But uh, I thank you for that information. I have never had the pleasure or the challenge of walking in the snow because I'm trying to be very careful. But I, being relatively new to this visual um, community, mm -hmm. I realize that snow can be very slippery. And that would be my biggest concern. Um, hypothermia, I would wear gloves, et cetera. But walking and dealing with a cane is very new to me on snow. And thinking that if it is an inch or more, there's a possibility that I'm not gonna feel where I normally feel when I'm walking. So that would be one of my concerns. You're absolutely correct. Um... Now, even rain also increases the, the slippery factor significantly, especially if we have leaves on the ground, like in the later fall after the trees shed. Um, snow, however, is particularly pernicious because at first, it's, it, you actually get a little bit more traction, like that, those first couple of inches. But <laughs> you give that snow a little bit of time and a little bit more cold, or maybe a hot, uh, a warm up followed by a cold. And suddenly that pretty white layer of fluff is now hiding ice or compacted uh -huh. snow that is, that is slippery under, under your foot. So how would, we, how would we travel in an environment where we feel that our footing could be uncertain, especially because the ground could be slippery because of, of snow, water, or ice. You would shorten your strides up quite a bit to make sure that you're not, you're not, you're not as likely to lose your balance. Pretty much, yeah. Keep your strides smaller. Keep your feet closer that's underneath you, right? As opposed to uh, further out when you, when you make a wide stride. Um, and with that in mind, you're going to slow down in general, okay? This is a turtle's race, not a rabbit race, okay? The turtle will win this race, okay? Because the rabbit is going to spin out. <laughs> so slow down. Um, so, so, um, uh, a, uh, a, a uh, more narrow stride and, you know, just, um, just paying attention to each footfall as it goes down. Um, the deeper the snow, the more concentration you have to do because suddenly as the snow gets deeper than let's say four or five inches, now it's actually sucking at your foot. It's actually, there's actually a layer of resistance, you know, that, that can go along with that. And when the snow is, is knee deep, well, even more. And now going back to the other point of comfort, um, so if you do dress, if, you're, if you are dressed appropriately in the snow, um, as you exercise more, okay? So as your, as your walk to your friends or to the work, to the work or your, whatever your destination might be, as you continue to walk, your body is burning calories. You're expending energy. And what happens as you exercise? Anyone? You get warmer. You get warmer. You can also sweat. If you sweat in the cold weather, that can be very dangerous. All right. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, I understand that the uh, the uh, the native peoples uh, of the far Arctic, um, they will deliberately slow their pace down if they think that they're starting to overheat because they cannot afford to be sweaty underneath all of that clothing. It actually will reduce the clothing's ability the, their, the clothing's ability to keep you warm, and then you have that 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 evaporation problem and you could sweat enough to actually make your clothing wet and then your clothing will be unable to retain heat and it can make things oh so much worse now granted we are not in uh we, we don't live in siberia or yukon territory um we we could have uh places of refuge to dump into just in case that happens but um, if we are in a snowstorm and it is nighttime, and if we are in some of the more rural parts of the state, um, or if it's after midnight and places are closed, you, you have to be uh, cognizant of the fact that um, you're in a much trickier situation than other times. Um, any other comments about snow, uh, slipping, winter travel in general? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. In traveling with either snow or rain and talking about walking and the shorter steps, that makes sense. I used to be a wide stepper where I would just step forward and move and I can see slipping. But what type of tread on a shoe would you recommend for either type of inclement weather? Hmm. You know, never really thought of it. Um, I am a huge fan of the lightweight hiking boot um, or, or, uh, or, or what they call um, trail shoes. So basically sneakers with a bit more tread in them. Um, there are folks um, who like live in Minnesota. They actually, have, um, they actually have spikes that you can strap onto your winter boots uh, just in case it gets like when the snow gets really deep and there's a layer of compacted snow and or ice underneath them. Um, I'd be very careful using them around here <laughs> because you walk into someone's house or business and you could really mess up the floor with those. Um, but it is a product that is available. Um, also your cane, um, you can also use different cane tips, uh, especially for the snow. The, the different cane tip may not make that much difference in the rain. Um, but snow, um, you could use the, um, some of the off-road cane tips, uh, such as the Bindu Basher or the Dakota Disc. Is anyone familiar with these items? I'm not. So a Bindu Basher uh, was developed in Southern Africa. Um, it basically turns a white cane into a reverse shepherd's crook. So it's basically, it's a giant hook. Um, I think it's about six or eight inches from where it, it hooks onto your cane to the bottom. And basically this, uh, this hook, is, it's mostly meant for going through deep grass, um, you know, or, or like, like, like high, you know, high grass, you know, maybe like ankle high grass. Um, then there's also something called a Dakota disc, which might actually be superior for the snow environment because the Dakota disc is about as wide as a grown man's hand span. So approximately eight to 10 inches wide. Um, it's flat on the bottom. It sort of gimbals, meaning that it moves freely, um, you know, around the, the, the point of the cane. So it could flop over if you're, if you're not paying attention. Um, but this is the sort of thing that you would use on maybe shorter grass, a dirt road, a gravel track, sand, and also um, you know, um, snow. So that can give you uh, quite a bit of tactual detection, um, but you've gotta be aware that especially the, uh, this um, Dakota disc, it will travel on top of the snow so you may not necessarily know what's underneath it. Um, mm. The Bindu Basher can slide um, loose snow around, but as, uh, as, as if anyone here is an experienced New Jersey resident, you give that snow a couple of days and it is not the pretty white fluffy stuff. 
you can now make murder snowballs with it after a couple of days because it gets hard and dense and packed. Right? Anything else about the snow, winter travel? Any what other questions? Are the, are, I guess you're talking about these cane tips. What kinds of canes are these for? Are these for Ambitech canes or NFB canes or what kinds of? Uh, mostly the, these would be um, for the Ambutech hook on cane. I, I do not believe, um, I do not believe they come in um, slide on versions. Um, I'm not certain, um, but I don't think, I'm not sure. I don't believe NFB has the same variety of cane tips that Ambutech does. All right, let's talk about the wind. All right, what could the wind do to, uh, to a traveler, to your mobility device? And how about any of these weather environments? What could they do to your guide dog? Any guide dog travelers? None tonight? No guide dog? No, I have one. I, I, I have a dog. All right. Yeah, yeah so, I mean, the, the, wind, the wind's the great distractor, right? I mean, it. so you already have bad vision. So now I'm going to whistle some wind in there. So let's make travel. Uh, if you're at intersections, you're trying to hear people, other dogs, cars, pedestrians. Now, I mean, it just is harder. I mean, it's not impossible, but it just makes it makes it harder. And I know my dog kind of doubles down. She doesn't love the wind coming buzzing right in her face, especially the cold one. And so maybe that makes the dog a little less attentive. Although, honestly, I haven't noticed it with mine, but, but I could see the possibility for sure. You are correct. Your dog is also a living being and your dog will experience discomfort the same way you do. Now, granted, maybe they're a bit tougher than we are. You know, they, they, they were designed to live outdoors all the time. We sort of evolved out of that. We lost an awful lot of our fur over the millennia. Um, but <clears throat> you have to be aware that it's not, if you're a guide dog user, a guide dog traveler, it's not just your life you have to take into consideration. And, um, you know, I got to stress that, you know, it's you and, and your guide dog. And in a lot of ways, you know, you are in custody of, of this creature and um, you know, you're responsible for, for their well-being and safety as well as your own. And to your point about the wind, you are absolutely correct. That when, when the wind is over about, I think, I guess 20 miles an hour, it can produce an absolute rumble in your ears when you turn properly. Um, you know, and, and, uh, and even if you're not turned directly into the wind, as it picks up speed, that, that wind noise, that rumble, uh, the, the noise that it makes in the trees or that the whistle, right? If it, if it gets strong enough, it, if you have like a guy wires or phone, phone um, telephone pole, electrical wires that you get, you gotta have that, that, that whistle. All these factors come together and they can mask all the sounds that we suddenly need for dynamic alignment and for street crossing. Um, when the wind gets too severe like that, you may, uh, and, and we're talking about all kinds of weather, you know, if the weather is getting to a point, uh, I'm not just talking about the, the governor closing the state due to a state of emergency because of a blizzard or a hurricane, but you really have to consider, it's like how much of our senses are going to be diminished by the weather. And when, when do we say when? When do we say enough? This is just too dangerous for me to travel independently. And that's really what I'm talking about, folks, traveling independently, not necessarily with a guide, because we can overcome an awful lot of obstacles with a sighted guide. But if we're traveling independently, you know, when are you going to say, uh, you know what? No, it's not safe enough anymore. You know, any questions or concerns at this, at this juncture? All right, so what else could the wind do aside from impact the sonic environment? Uh, where, where I live, we've had violent storms 
three weeks in a row with winds up to 70 miles an hour. Yikes. And, uh, so there's a lot of debris, a lot of flying objects. Mm -hmm. Even after the wind subsides, you need to be careful where you walk because the environment's not like it used to be. Indeed, wind, rain, blizzards, um, other assorted wind events. Um, yeah, they, there's certainly a bunch of stuff in the middle of the sidewalk and in the road that wasn't there before. Um, and and not, not just the usual stuff, not just the usual you know, leaves and trash, you could have electrical wires. Uh, yeah. You could have significant pieces of architecture, you know, like gutters and parts of chimneys and bricks um, that are suddenly, they're, they're suddenly there, you know. And if you're, if this was a familiar uh, route of travel for you, um, it could be, uh, it could be a bit more hazardous. Suddenly you have to walk slower because there's stuff that you have to avoid. There's brand new tripping hazards. Um, it could even knock out the power. If you are relying on a traffic light at a certain intersection after a particularly nasty storm, that traffic light could be non-operational. And if there's no one directing traffic at that traffic signal, do you know what the rule, does anyone know what the rule is for motorists when you're at a, uh, a traffic signal that's blacked out? It's the same as a four-way stop sign. That is correct. But guess what? Um, it gets a little confusing. It sure does, absolutely, and not everyone's aware of it, and then not everyone is really aware or cares what the pedestrian's right-of-way is at that traffic signal. Um, it could very well be that regardless of how you feel, regardless of how good the weather is after that, that storm, if that traffic light is out, you may want to really seriously consider rerouting your path to maybe find an actual stop sign um, or, or a traffic signal that is operational. You know, that's a, that's a, that's a real significant thing. Um, what about your cane? What do you think as a cane traveler, the wind the, or, or, or snow could do to your cane? How about just blowing it around? You know? Slip it. What was that? It could flip it and blow it out of your hand, actually. Yeah. A 70 mile an hour wind can take your cane and you may never, ever find it again. <laughs> and But, you know, if, if winds are getting up to gale force, and I'm talking like 40, 30, 40 miles an hour, you may want to consider staying inside because flying debris <laughs> can be quite painful. Possibly even life ending. Uh, but with, but 70 miles an hour, that's hurricane speeds. Um, unless the zombies are in your basement, uh, stay inside. Absolutely. But yes, so not only can it dislodge your cane, but it can really mess up your technique. Yeah. You know, and it, it could also, you know, not, it could also knock you down. A 70 mile an hour wind can absolutely knock you. It can knock your guide dog down. Uh, if it could take a chimney off your roof, it could certainly knock you down. Any other questions or concerns or notations? Anyone? Anyone have any questions? You can, you, or notations? you can present yeah, direction. I'm sorry, what about direction? You can lose your sense of direction. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, because, you know, if, if your sonic cues are suddenly um, hidden by the wind and the wind is blowing you and blowing your cane, yeah, you, you, you can definitely um, become disoriented very quickly. So what do you think your backup plan should be if, something like that happens. Go get a cup of coffee. Yeah. Close to Starbucks. A absolutely. You know, <laughs> shoreline your way to the closest building. Absolutely. You know, get undercover. Yeah. Lightning too. If you if if someone if you hear someone note that they that they just caught a flash of lightning or the moment you hear thunder, it's time to get inside. Okay, because 
as a, as a human being, most of us are between, you know, four and a half feet and six feet tall in this group, you know, and lightning likes finding tall stuff. It could even find your cane. You know, that, and, and, and that could be kind of uncomfortable. <laughs> nope. All right. Any other concerns about traveling in the rain, traveling in the snow, traveling in the wind? It would be extremely rare to have violent weather without a forecast or announcing it, and you having the ability to know about it. So if you go out in that kind of weather, that's foolhardy. <laughs> I, I totally agree. I absolutely agree. But you know what? Um, there's a lot of folks nowadays that don't necessarily watch the news. Um, not everyone is um, as weather oriented as we are here in New Jersey. Um, I have actually met a number of students of various ages um, who really question me. It's like, really? You want me to get the weather report every night before I go to bed? It, you, you, you're right. It's, it, it, there's, um, I, I don't understand how you can, you, how you can wait, uh, oh, you know, wait till the morning, stick your head out the window and decide what you're going to put on in the morning. Um, well, especially since I tend to get up before the sun rises a lot. So I don't have, really have that luxury. Um, but just planning your day, um, with, you know, uh, plan your day just based on the weather. Um, you know, you're not going to go to the, you're going to really go to the beach if you think that there's a significant possibility of a thunderstorm. People do, which confounds me. <laughs> but yeah, there's a, uh, there's a, um, there's an ignorance factor out there that those of us who are low vision, no vision, we cannot afford that luxury of ignorance. All right, let's move on to the hot. Let's talk about July. The sky of clearest azure blue and a big orange ball of sun beating down on you. What do you think about that? How is that gonna impact your travel? Anyone? Well, exhaustion is one thing. Yeah, absolutely. Um, heat exhaustion, which can lead to heat stroke, or do I, or maybe I have it backwards. But um, uh, you know, you will know when you are feeling when the heat has started to really impact your body, um, because if it gets hot enough to start raising your core body temperature, you are in very critical danger of death. And if not death, then internal organ damage or brain damage. Um, during during my uh, our techniques classes uh, when we learned cane techniques in O and M was in Philadelphia during the summer. Uh, we would be reprimanded if we were not if we did not have a full bottle of water with us at the beginning of class. And 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 we would be instructed periodically by the professors: you will drink water now. Okay, um, so aside, so yes, so as, as we walk in the, in the heat, um, you start to slow down. Um, the sweat and the heat causes discomfort. If you're starting to get really hot, you can develop a headache, um, especially those of us who are susceptible to migraines or other, and, and other medical conditions. Other medical conditions can be greatly exacerbated by the heat um, or even the cold. Certain medical, certain um, medicines uh, can impact the way the body regulates temperature, in particular certain psychotropic drugs. Um, I've had students where uh, if the weather's too cold, they can't go, or too hot, they can't go out because their ability to, to regulate their body temperature has been compromised. Um, what about the pavement? It's very hot. It can be. I'm my cat. And uh, what about your poor guide dog? Because they don't wear shoes. Yeah, that's always a tricky one. Yeah. With how, how hot's too hot. And I, I, so 
I have these small little boots that I can use for when it's very cold or when it's very warm. My friend uses it religiously above 80 degrees. He said, if it's above 80, I just put them on. Dog hates it, but the dog's used to it now. So they, you know, walks, walks with it, you know, walks with their little boots and it does okay. But, I mean, yeah, they could, they could burn their little footies, their little, nope. those little pads, you know, and, and no one likes that. Um, so yeah, as a, as a cane traveler, or, or especially as a guide dog traveler, I mean, it's, it's hard for you to choose which pavement you're going to walk on because that, that's really up to your dog, you know, and, and if your dog, you know, if, if, if she missteps, you know, that, that could be bad. But if you, if you know that, um, oh, you know what, maybe, um, maybe if I could avoid a wider street crossing, you know, maybe I could find a two lane street crossing instead of a four lane street crossing. Um, or, uh, or maybe definitely do not cut through the playground. Um, I, I heard some horror stories of New York city playgrounds and kids getting, uh, burned on the, uh, on the, the fancy, um, soft, um, not bone breaking, uh, pavement that they have. I, uh, maybe they tore that up already. I don't know, but, um, it's definitely a consideration. Um, and, uh, you know, well, also, um, your, you know, your, your technology, if you're using a cell phone to navigate, you know, if you're using Lazarillo or um, Soundscape or, or something like that, um, very, very cold, very, very hot and wet can damage and shut down your phone. So if you're relying on that for um, information about where you're going um, or if your, your bus pass is on your phone or something like that, um, you may want to seriously rethink, well, how are you using that phone? So if you are getting, uh, let's say, map information from it, uh, you may want to put that phone in an inside pocket so that the sun does not directly get at it or so that, the, so that the, your body is warming your phone up, you know, inside, you know, and you have uh, earphones so that you can, so that you can hear. Um, so that your phone is not damaged by the, the hot, the wet, or the cold. Um, also, your, your choice of clothing in all these environments is crucial because um, if you're expecting very cold or very wet weather and you do this, uh, for those who can't see, I just put a hood up. This in and of itself has just modified my sonic environment. Okay, so a hood or a hat or a scarf that covers the ears, um, it can reduce sound, it can mess with your ability to localize a sound. Does anyone, everyone know what I mean by that term, localize a sound? Basically, you're- you know using, where it's coming from. Exactly, you're, you're using that sound as, a, as a, basically a piece of directional information. You know, so, um, it can, it, can, it can throw that off. It could definitely muffle the outside world. And so also if you're using, if you're using um, he uh, headphones uh, you know, to, to navigate, if you're using the phone for that, you probably want to use a bone induction uh, headphone. Does anyone know what those are? Uh, basically the sound it does not, is not actually directly generated by the ear phone and then that sound is projected into the ear canal it's actually um i'm not sure where mine is at the moment but it, it's actually worn over the ear and on the temple the the bone that's right in front of um the ear and it the vibration actually travels through the device into your your bone and then your cochlea picks up the signal there now it's good because you're not covering your ear, you're not blocking your ear. So theoretically, you are still able to hear outside sounds, but as I make a big time out, you are still producing an additional sound. You could still mask other sounds when you do that. So I am not a fan of a cane traveler or a guide dog traveler listening to music on a Walkman or an iPod or iPhone while they're traveling, simply because it can mask sounds, even if 
you're using a bone induction headphone. So my advice is if you're going to use bone induction headphones, use it with a real purpose, like navigational information. Uh, take that phone call when you're done traveling and rock out to your favorite tunes when you're inside. Um, but again, if you're going to be using it, make sure that the volume is not overly loud and you may want to delay a street crossing until the application has stopped talking. Or you may actually wanna pause the application when you're about to do something like crossing the street. All right, any other questions or concerns? Dara, you had your hand up before. Yeah, it was on the topic of hydration. I just wanted to order, uh, offer a tip that I use. I don't do well in heat at all. <laughs> and uh, a lot of times when I'm traveling where it's the summer, besides carrying a liter of water, I watch out for my electrolytes because even water doesn't do it for me. And I start mm. to, oh my, I could even faint. I'd get that, you know, heat really affects me. So I always make sure I also have a, an electrolyte type of drink, such as a Gatorade or something like that, because water may not do it for me when it gets hot. Mm. Good point. Indeed, indeed. Um, you know, health has a, such so much to do with, with temperature. Um, you know, uh, th there, there's, uh, you know, um, be, being, being a little bit overweight can radically um, cause problems when it comes to temperature because your body's already working a little bit harder. Um, and then you throw diabetes into the mix, um, you know, or, or some of your other autoimmune disorders. Um, and then temperature is, is it, it can, it can re really just wreak Mary Hob with your metabolism. Um, what about footwear? I know we discussed footwear for traction in the snow and the ice, but anyone else about footwear? So to me, footwear is a very personal decision. I do not like, I do not, I will not dictate what you're going to wear. But if it is 20 degrees out and you're wearing flip-flops, you're gonna hear about it from me. All right, in fact, if you refuse to put shoes and socks on, I may cancel the lesson. That's how strongly I feel about that. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, what about um, frostbite and sunburn? Anyone? You have to pick the time of day when you go out. In, indeed, absolutely. You know, so basically these are, these are that there's a skin damage that, which is caused by opposite ends of the spectrum. Um, I don't think I have to define either for anyone in the group, um, but yes. So when it comes to the summertime, uh, big floppy hat, sunscreen, uh, and you may want to choose, you may have to decide that you are not going to travel um, during the hottest part of the day. Uh, also, mm -hmm. if you, you're experiencing glare, uh, glare can be um, radically affected by the time of day, time of year, and what kind, what, and what's on the ground. I mean, for me personally, I don't have many issues with glare, but a sunny day with a blanket of snow on the ground is really positively blinding for me. I really, really have to wear my darkest sunshades on a day like that. And people who, are, who have albinism, um, uh, I, I can't even imagine what a blanket of snow and a noonday, noonday sun would be. Uh, but conversely, they, you know, uh, being outside um, at noon, in July can also be um, horrific for someone who has fair skin uh, and, and other metabolic issues. Anyone else? All right, we discussed footwear and for the most part, it is a personal decision. Just don't be stupid about it. We did discuss hats and hoods and how it could also um, mask sounds. What about gloves, folks? 
We wear gloves for a wide variety of reasons. You wear too thick of a glove, you'll have trouble feeling your cane in your hand? Among other things, yes. You know, so, I mean, um, my hands get cold very, very quickly. You know, and, and it gets, it's to the point where they could actually become painful and uncomfortable. Um, my, uh, it's been suggested I have something called Renoir or Renault syndrome, uh, where you may have a problem with your, your bo regulating your body temperature or your, your, when it gets too cold. Um, so that's a really tough decision. Um, you need to be able to feel your cane. But at the same time, you don't want frostbite on your hands, you know, and, and if your hand is so uncomfortable um, that you can't even hold your cane or feel tactual information through it anymore, you've, you've just defeated the purpose. So that's a real balancing act. Um, you may want to um, keep your core, your, 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 your torso, if you, if, you, if you keep that warm, um, especially in a, if you have something like, um, like Renault syndrome, uh, because it, your body, the way your body protects itself from being too cold is if your body thinks it's too cold, it will withdraw blood from the hands and feet to keep the more important parts of the body warm. So your internal organs in your torso and your brain. So, so basically that's why your hands get cold because all that 98 degree blood is going somewhere else you know so if you could trick your body and then saying well it's cold but it's not that cold um and it did seem now this is anecdotal evidence i can't quantify it but this summer i uh, th this summer this winter i actually made very very detailed preparations to keep my core warm and I could wear a thinner glove or even no gloves at the time. And it was, at least I thought it was somewhat effective. I'm not really sure about what the research actually says, um, but yes, there's that. Um, anyone else, any other concerns, questions? I'd like to add a note of suggestion. <laughs> Recently, I was in need of a new phone, so. I was blessed to get one. And this is Wendy. Um, what I'm realizing on my new phone, they have a an SOS. And I'm thinking about when you're talking about the heavy winds. I do realize that at times when you go into your job or you're going someplace, you go in, the weather's one way, you come out, sometimes it's another. And in heavy, heavy winds, it can be a problem, especially if you were not prepared for it. But if you ever get on a street or somewhere in the snow and you can't, you, you're not quite sure where you are or you can't move anymore because it's too high, you can SOS the 911 if you choose to. And the police service will come and escort you where you need to go for your own safety. So they are there um, assisting our community in any way they can. I've accidentally touched the button because I was learning how to use my phone and they were immediately mm. on the spot asking, did I need any help? So we can utilize that service on our phone. And most people, I think, have the 911. Indeed, indeed, absolutely. and. And even in even if you're even if you're not going to summon um, emergency services to your location, um, a very significant rapid weather change uh, these can really catch us off guard. Um, I was mentioning uh, before the the seminar began that a a hailstorm in my community it blew up. It just it just came and went, and it happened so fast and it was so intense. It was really like a monsoon. I mean, the the rain and the pellets of ice were so intense that um, if I wasn't if I wasn't in a car when this happened, I would have definitely sought shelter immediately. Um, but to your point, Peggy, uh, if if there is a really rapid and significant weather change. Um, or if the weather has progressed to the point where 
the wind is progressed to the point where it's it is just blasting out all of your all of your sonic details um or if if the the snow has become so intense that um you're you're not just concerned about um, you finding your way because your sonic and tactual cues have been hidden under all that snow. Feel free to ask for help. Ask for a sighted guide. Ask for someone who has more vision than you to help you in and out of that circumstance. Um, you know the, the, that's when the self advocacy really comes in because. We want to be as independent as possible for as long as possible, but there's always going to come that point. And believe me, I am a, I am a true man. I hate asking for help, and I certainly hate for asking for directions. Um, but I will. Hi, I, I'm getting older, and I'm getting. I like to think I'm getting wiser. We'll see. But yes, I have started. I have even started asking help. I've even started asking directions. And not, e and not even with a girlfriend to nudge me. I've actually done it independently. Um, but yes, asking for sighted guide is, is a valid way of, uh, is a valid workaround for this particular environment. All right, anyone else? Is there any, any kind of weather I've missed? Any other questions? Any funny jokes? But keep it clean. This is a family forum. <laughs> I, I I would say that I thank you very much. It's timely, and I, I I'm, I'm convinced we're having weather changes, uh, climate changes. I'm not sure why, and I won't argue that point. But but down here we're seeing a lot more violent weather. We're seeing a lot more hurricanes. So we all do need to be more cognizant of the weather. Absolutely. And just this time of year, the weather is so changeable. Um, what, what's, the, what's the expression in like, a, in like a lion out like a lamb? Or, or, or is that about March? March? That's about March. That's about March. <laughs> but, but April uh, may not be as windy, but the, the variability of weather is... <clears throat> is very significant. I mean, I saw on the forecast for next week because, um, you know, um, it could get up into the 70s. But guess what, folks? We could have a tulip-killing snowstorm Easter Sunday. It's entirely possible. I'm not hoping for one, but, uh, but yeah, it happens. Absolutely. It's even snowed in May. When I graduated from Rutgers in 1990, during senior week, it did. It it snowed in New Brunswick. It was only flurries, but it was snow. It was snow on Cinco de Mayo. Well, that's not my concern. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have a question. So, sure. like with weather apps, the Weather Channel, um, you know, whatever weather apps you have on your phone, how accessible is when, um, you know, when you get those announcements, weather announcements. Just voiceover pick them up. Um, I think you have to you have to do it app by app. Um, you know, so like uh, I've I've never really actually tried it, and I'm gonna probably I'd like to actually try that with a student. But um, I think you 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 actually have to try it. You know, each each app. Um, although I did um, one of the apps that's been my favorite, but I may have to rethink that is is an app called Dark Skies. Um, a colleague of mine re recommended it to me because um, my colleague felt that unlike everyone else in the company at the time, I was the only one who was actually using mass transit. So of everyone, he thought that I really needed a real time, real world weather report. So, um, and most of the time it really is good, you know? So it really does let me know that the rain is coming within, you know, five to 10 minutes. But for this hailstorm that happened Sunday, it completely bricked. Completely, it completely missed the whole thing. Now, uh, we've been also having some power problems here on my street. So maybe my internet was not as good as it could be. I don't know, but it, it certainly let me down on Sunday. Um, so uh, it, it may just require a certain amount of experimentation. 
Um, I have not, there's a website called Apple Viz, I think it's called, Mm -hmm. which uh, used to, I'm not sure if it's still operational, but this was a forum um, for people to discuss Apple products and how disability friendly they were. Again, I'm not sure if this forum still exists or not. Still Um, exists. It does? Okay. So that might be a good, that might be a good place uh, for starting research as to how accessible these apps are. But you're absolutely right. If, if your phone makes a, a bang and a vibration and you're unable to access what that meaning of that sound or vibration was, uh, you're, you might as well just be carrying a, a paperweight that makes funny noises. You know, but if it could actually say, you know, weather report, you know, National Weather Service reports a line of thunderstorms going from here to here, going this way at this speed, take cover. Right. You can get those because it, it'll it also give you a very loud noise when it goes off. So it does announce them. Yeah, okay. for an emergency. Well, like if yeah. there's an emergency in broadcasting system. Correct. Yeah, that I know. That I know it makes a noise. I was wondering, like every once in a while, my weather app will pop up and say, um, rain alert or rain in your area in at 7.05. I and get I that also. Does voiceover read it? And yes. I'm, it does. Yes. Oh, sweet. And now I know oh, that. Well, that's good to know. I was today <laughs> years old when I learned that. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Peggy. You're welcome. All right. Anyone else? Um, hi, Doug. It's Betsy. Um, there's something oh. I wanted to share. Um, I suffer from light sensitivity. So if I'm walking somewhere and my eyes are open, it kind of messes up my mobility. A friend of mine found these blackout sunglasses that are awesome. It's like mm-hmm. having a blindfold on your eyes. It's totally dark. Wow. And you can get them from Amazon for 20 bucks. Wow. So it lets out. It's It was, I guess, designed for people who want to sleep on an airplane or you know, if someone has lights on in your house and you want to go to bed. And they work really, really, really well. Um, so it's definitely a cool thing. I was looking for the darkest sunglasses I could find, and these are the darkest of darkest. Wow. <laughs> so they're really cool. You know, and that is an option. If you are, in fact, a, a, a seasoned cane traveler um, you know, or a guide dog user, and if your residual vision is, in fact, causing you more more trouble than it's worth you you know feel free to if you have the skills turn it off use your other skills uh, and and um and use them to to get to where you have to go um yeah that it is a that that is valid absolutely and of course you know if if you if you don't require complete blackout conditions have your sunshades with you at all times you know, because just just to keep, if you anything, just to keep grit and schmutz out of your eyes, um, you know, because an ultraviolet light does cause damage to the cornea. It truly does. And we need to keep what we got if we're still using it, right? All right. Well, I'll any other questions it. or comments for for Douglas? Good job. <laughs> Okay, and just one final thing, space weather. Okay, I don't think we have to be worried about uh, being fried by cosmic rays or anything like that, but it can interfere with our phones. All right, so, um, you know, uh, as, as a Boy Scout, I'm a firm, firm believer in be prepared. You may wanna keep a little bit of change with you, <laughs> Or uh, have a credit card memorized so you can maybe find a payphone if such things still exist. If you need to make that last first that last phone call, um, but yes, yeah, space weather can with with modern cell phone technology can certainly muck it up pretty good. My biggest fear is going on a trip, a vacation, and losing my phone, or oh. getting back from the airport and not being able to get into an Uber because I don't have my phone. Right. I, yeah. I missed the beginning of the call. Did you have any tips for something like that? Uh, no, I don't. But uh, maybe a lanyard that's attached to you and your phone. Um, 
it's always been my nightmare. Oh, thing. don't think about that though. Just think about a place where that you keep your phone. Well, that's a reason I think to bring some money with you. If yes. you ever have to pay for a taxi, I guess. Yes. Oh, absolutely. You know, um, always you know, have a plan B. Right. You know, we, we haven't reached the George Jetson era of a cashless society. <laughs> and quite frankly, I'm not sure I'm prepared for it. Oh, they uh -huh. haven't. They have in Whole Foods and Amazon. They have chip. They want to put chips in your hand now. Yeah. Oh. And I'm not going. <laughs> Me neither. No. <laughs> if I can add for her fear of nope. losing it in the um, airport. This is Wendy again. Go I want to share with her. My son's on his way from Australia. And we were paranoid about him using his phone. He's very sighted. But of course, we being um, visually challenged, as I would call it, I reached out to the airport. They do have courtesy phones there for anyone. And they will make a phone call for you in case that occurs. So go I for it. I didn't know that, Wendy. Thank you. Thank you, Wendy. I didn't I know that. I just found out. I and just found I that it. we're trying to get him from Australia, so he has to take a shot. But I was worried about the phone because they charge you for the roving charges. So they said, Indeed. oh, don't worry about it. When he gets here, <coughs> he can do a courtesy phone call, and they will get to you. And I said, wow, that makes it a lot easier. So Good there you have... go. You ready to travel? <laughs> Thank you. You're welcome. Doug, do you have anything to to uh, add? No, I think I think I've reached the end of my talk. Um, so that's 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 O and M and weather. So thank you all for having me. I really appreciate it. Doug, thank you so much for being with us, and I love all your aggravating circumstances and your sonic environment and all your your terminology. Um, you are a wealth of information and we thank you very much. And I hope that everyone has good weather for the next <laughs> upcoming weeks. Yes. Thank you so much. Easter, please. <laughs> Thanks, Doug. Pleasure. Thank, right, you. Please. thank you so much, Doug. A, it was a pleasure. Have a good Thanks, night, Doug. everyone. From all of us at Vision Alliance. Uh, we knows. thank everyone for joining us. We'll see you all again very soon. Take Bye. care. Bye. Good Thank night, you. everyone. Good night. Good night. Stay well. Good night. Thank you, Doug. Stay safe down there.